thank you uh well, and thank you for having me online i hope i'll be able to keep you as entertained uh in this format as i hope i would be able to do it in, in person so um well you've already heard the title so there's no point in repeating that uh so let me give a bit of a brief outline of uh, how i hope uh this should um kind of a uh, look in the next 30 minutes or so. So first, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the different types of belief uh, that we are interested in when we're talking about uh, this kind of acquisition of, of beliefs from fiction. Uh, then I will say a few words about uh, what seems to be a kind of a general consensus, at least among philosophers, uh, that uh, this is indeed the case that people do regularly acquire beliefs from fictions, then I will kind of um, point out to, uh, well, the most recent meta-analysis on this issue, which is in fact critical of this acceptance, uh, and then I will kind of spend the second part of my talk uh, mostly looking uh, into kind of this, if there is such a thing as belief acquisition, what might be the mechanisms which are, have been proposed and what might kind of uh, issues with them be. So, going to uh, beliefs. Now, there's uh, certainly uh, there's more than this, but these are usually the types of beliefs people are interested in when they talk about uh, this kind of a belief acquisition from fiction. Uh, this can be things like uh, perceptual facts, so things like, uh, you know, how does uh, a tiger look like, uh, how does um, a, a raven sound, uh, so these kind of things that you're usually uh, conveyed by some sorts of fictions better than others, usually all the visual ones uh, can do that better than uh, literary ones. Now, then uh, there are um, beliefs about propositional facts, uh, probably something that there is most agreement on that uh, is generally picked up from fictions. So these are things like London is the capital of uh, UK, the European Commission is uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, Angela Merkel used to be the Prime Minister of Germany. So things like this. Now, then there are, uh, well, this should be uh, kind of a experiences, not really experiential beliefs. So there are beliefs about how it is uh, um, to be, let's say, in a certain situation. So for instance, how it is to uh, you know, be in a war zone, how it is to fly, uh, on an, in an airplane, how it is to, you know, ride a horse. So there are also state, so there are also claims that kind of a fiction can bring about these kinds of beliefs. No? And then there are things such as beliefs in stereotypes. So this is something that is kind of a particularly of importance, um, uh, in kind of my discipline uh, or in general kind of let's say so film criticism literary criticism which seems to revolve around this kind of a uh, broad questions of ideology critique uh, where it has kind of generally been assumed for a long time uh, that essentially uh, art uh, various forms of fictions contribute to kind of a stereotypical views of um underrepresented groups and minorities such as uh, women and all sorts of minorities, uh, sexual, ethnic, uh, uh, class, race, and so forth. No? And then there are kind of a more general beliefs about, um, let's say, how the world works, how the kind of inter-human relationships operate, uh, how the kind of a, what a friendship might look like, what a romantic affair might look like, uh, how a, you know, reasonable kind of a, uh, relations between parents might look like and so forth. No? And, but from all of these things, I'll be mostly talking about propositional facts. No? Now, uh, there seems to be, um, general acceptance of this view that we do indeed kind of a pick up, um, beliefs from fictions. Uh, certainly, uh, this must be the case among people who advocate for uh, cognitive value of art. 
uh, mostly they talk about you know the, the fact that we can acquire knowledge from art, uh, various forms of knowledge. But of course, you know, implicitly there, they also say that we must be acquiring also some kind of a, a beliefs, and not only beliefs but also true beliefs. So one reason. So this is uh, this is a long tradition. Uh, but for instance, you know, just to single out one or two recent works, uh, Rafe McGregor, for instance, has uh, spoken in his uh, very recent Criminology of Narrative Fiction uh, that uh, this kind of narrative fictions provide all sorts of uh, types of knowledge uh, about uh, the kind of reasons that there is uh, social injustices in the world and reasons for why there is crime. No? So he provides examples of, for instance, phenomenological knowledge, what I've been talking about here uh, in terms of this experiential knowledge, and also mimetic knowledge of so probably things like perceptual knowledge, uh, per uh, beliefs about uh, perceptual facts and, and certainly about uh, propositional facts. No? Uh, focusing more on uh, uh, audiovisual media, Carl Plantica has spoken also about, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, value of screen stories for uh, building our ethical knowledge uh, and generally kind of a moral understanding of the world. Now, even uh, those who are uh, quite skeptical about knowledge acquisition um, are pretty certain on type of certain types of uh, beliefs, specifically uh, propositional beliefs. So, for instance, Kari, who in his also quite recent book, Imagining and Knowing, where he kind of goes out of his way to to criticize a lot of the views about this kind of arts cognitive value, even he then kind of admits. Uh, that, well, it is an obvious truth that fictions affect the beliefs of those who come into contact with them. No? And then he gives a couple of examples of what he uh, has, uh, well, at least what he thinks he has come to believe uh, from reading fiction. No? Uh, now, sorry. now, the evidence beyond this kind of anecdotal references about, you know, I've read this and then I've kind of generated, generated this belief, um, is usually not so much cited among, at least not the empirical one, uh, is not so much cited among those who see art's value. Uh, they seem to be kind of, um, their arguments seem more to revolve around the kind of a, uh, pointing out to works of art, which when you do check them, have a lot of kind of factual truths in them. And they kind of uh, seem to be content with the idea that, you know, the very virtue that there are works of art uh, of this sort, this means that, you know, we can generate beliefs, which are also true, and this can lead to, to knowledge. No? Now, on the other hand, uh, those who seem to be a bit more skeptical uh, seem to engage with this kind of empirical literature a bit more. Uh, but even them, uh, they seem to be citing a relatively limited kind of um, set of studies. Usually people who appear here are kind of Green and Brock in some kind of a combination, Prentice and Gehrig, and then there can be work by, let's say, Marsh and, and so forth. No? Uh, but it's usually you know, five to ten studies that seem to be uh, recurrent examples of um, what is usually represented as systematic evidence of uh, acquisition of belief from fictions. Now... When one c looks at the largest kind of a uh, meta-analysis of, of belief acquisition, uh, so this is a more kind of a broader meta-analysis. Uh, this is an analysis of how different forms of narratives influence not only beliefs, but they also influence attitudes, intentions, and behaviors. But here I'll be talking about uh, strictly about beliefs. So here the... Well, let's put it clearly. <laughs> Here, the conclusion is, in fact, that quite the opposite of what uh, uh, um, even Curry is so certain of. Now, so this is a direct quote from from Beredica Dillard, who say that you know non-fictional narrative stimuli significantly uh, affect belief change, 
but fictional narrative stimuli do not. So experiments usually look something like people are given uh, uh, um, a fictional text about something. They're also given a uh, uh, non-fictional text. Uh, uh, and then there is also, the, so it depends on what the control group is, but usually the result, so usually what people are asked is after reading this text, they're given some type of a kind of a general knowledge test. No? And then, of course, there will be some questions there which relate to the information they would have been reading either in the fictional or in the non-fictional text. No? And then the uh, that then what essentially Bradley and Diller have shown that on average, uh, while non-fictional kind of a narratives will change your kind of a responses in this general knowledge tests. Uh, fictional ones won't really do that, at least not on, on, a, on a significant level. Uh, so, you know, the first probably point to take from this is, you know, uh, it is certainly not an obvious truth that there is belief acquisition when it comes to uh, engaging with fictional texts. Now, for the second part of the talk, uh, I'd like to focus on the kind of a mechanisms that have been proposed under the assumption that there is uh, belief acquisition. Now, of course, th these are not all of the mechanisms, but some of the kind of um, more, let's say, prominent ones. Uh, and of course, this is a bit of a schematic divisions because there is, of course, uh, well, constant, let's say, uh, uh, well, at least if not, is uh, well, there's a kind of, a, uh, let's say, uh, philosophers are certainly uh, more aware of, let's say, psychological literature uh, than the other way around, but that's simply because you know philosophers are picking up from uh, the empirical work that's being done and then trying to fine tune it. Now. So the first kind of um, general idea relates to availability heuristic. Now, so this is a phenomenon uh, that has been identified by Tversky and Kahneman in the in the seventies. Uh, they would go on to win Nobel Prizes for uh, what's called uh, in this new field of economics, behavioral economics, uh, where they were trying to essentially figure out um, how people actually make decisions as opposed to how they would, you know, ideally make decisions according to some things like practical reasoning uh, and so forth. Uh, and the idea is that um, after you know, conducting a range of experiments, uh, it seems that people, when asked, you know, well, when asked to do things or asked to kind of uh, answer certain types of questions, uh, they essentially use the information that is the most readily available because the logic goes something like, well, if it can be recalled the most quickly, then it must be important. So for instance, then the idea is if you have, you know, a read um, text, a fictional text in which, uh, for instance, um, it is wrongly said that uh, Rijeka is a capital of Croatia and because, you know, you've never heard of Croatia, or, or let alone what the capital of Croatia might be, you're then prone to simply, when asked, when prompted a question soon after that, you know, what's the capital of Croatia, you'll, you'll, you'll be more likely to say Rijeka than anything else. No? Now, while this kind of operates in a number of, uh, let's say, decision-making domains, uh, one, if it were the case that it also operates uh, when engaging fiction, uh, then you would expect certain uh, types of results. And this is certainly not the types of results that the kind of a meta-analysis that I spoke about uh, lays out. So whereas this might be a valid type of kind of a, um, wh whereas available her heuristic might be kind of a valid uh, explanation for nonfiction, or at least, you know, the effects of nonfictions on belief, it certainly can't be the case uh, for fiction because, you know, there is no significant kind of a belief acquisition. Uh, the other thing with availability heuristic is a more kind of a theoretical problem, and that is that usually, at least, you know, what we're interested when we're talking about belief acquisition is that these are things which have some kind of a longevity to them, no? That, you know, if you're acquiring beliefs, you're acquiring you know, some kind of stereotypes, it's not that you just have this stereotype, you know, uh, immediately in the post-test, you know, on the same day that you've been engaged with some uh, fictional work, 
but rather we're probably interested in phenomena which you know have some kind of a long term uh, uh um, let's say uh you know duration here and the very nature of availability heuristic is precisely that it will you know by by definition it will dissipate you know because it will no longer be readily available for a call so something that tries to tackle this uh is this idea of um acceptance by default no um uh, and it's something in fact that um, daniel gilbert uh, kind of claims to have gotten um let's say some kind of um suggestion from 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 uh, by reading spinoza's work and in fact it's precisely the opposite of what uh, samuel taylor coleridge in his kind of early 19th century uh, understanding of of well this kind of a classic definition of fiction as willing suspension of this belief so gilbert uh, by contract says well in fact no we're not willingly suspending this belief what we're doing is in fact willingly constru- uh, so we're not willingly suspending this belief we're willingly su- constructing belief so the idea is that um in fact whatever we hear see it's we're kind of a prime to take that by default and then only later if some kind of a needs need need need, need arises then do we kind of um essentially actively uh you know um negate those beliefs and actively work work, work on kind of reframing and refreshing now the issue with this is this clearly cannot be true for fictions in general huh? it certainly cannot be true for uh fictions which have highly invented content you know it cannot be true that uh average people when engaging game of thrones uh that they kind of by default accept that there is such a place like westeros and that where dragons are flying around or that there is such a place like middle earth where well they might not be flying around that much but at least they are kind of uh, hoarding money uh and coins somewhere in the in the uh, in the mines or for instance you know when engaging uh star wars that people immediately believe that uh somewhere long ago there was a interstellar uh, empire of such and such quality no? uh and it also doesn't really work for a range of other domains such as uh so for instance things like hyperbole if somebody came up to you uh you know well, came up to you just like in, in everyday conversation told you something like i'm so hungry i could eat a horse uh it's very unlikely you know that anybody would take this for granted and then go on to kind of a uh, dismiss it it seems to be that there is always this kind of a pragmatic preprocessing going on where you first take into consideration the speaker's intentions and only then uh do you kind of uh, evaluate the kind of uh, well may generate beliefs about the content of the uh, claim being made uh now turning to some kind of a um, let's say philosophical updates of uh psychological uh theories that have been around uh, um for instance uh, in her article on uh, believing in stories a friend essentially picks up uh again this couple of uh, uh studies by by strange and prentice and gerig who which kind of a claim that counterintuitively uh people who have engaged fictional text uh seem to have generated more beliefs than people who ca- who have uh engaged with non-fictional ones no so then on the basis of these one or two experiments uh the idea has been proposed well in fact it's fiction that label that, that you know if you label something as fiction it's in fact that that will lower your scrutiny in generating beliefs as opposed to you know non fiction you might be you know you might be very critical of you know michael moore in general so when you re- watch his documentary uh you are you know prone to not believe in it you know you might be very critical about you know the state of media so when you watch you know media's uh and you know reports most recent reports of what's going on in the world you might also be 
more skeptical. But then when you're you know, uh, given something which is labeled fiction, uh, the idea is, well, you're kind of, you let your guard down because, you know, it's not fact. No? But then, contrary to Italy, allegedly, there is a higher effect. Now, again, you know, while this is true for one or two studies, Braddock and Dillard have shown that this is certainly not true overall. So, by extension, there can't really be any scrutiny lowering. No? And also, you know, to return to this more theoretical point of, of um, counterintuitiveness, if indeed fiction is something that, you know, in this, not, not, so if we, we're talking about here, not about some kind of more technical Waltonian definitions of fiction, but something more, let's say, folk psychological understanding of fiction, where, you know, people simply, you know, usually people will take fiction to be something sim simply which is not real, something that is invented, no? So that there really is then a problem of like, why would there be scrutiny lowering if your, uh, you know, average person engaging fiction uh, is somebody who doesn't think fiction is true. Huh? Now, uh, one more kind of a proposal that I'll address is uh, a most recent kind of a proposal that has been uh, um, put forward by Kari. So he has a kind of a concept of narrative value. Uh, where he points out that it's often the case in, in, in fictions that uh, usually where things deviate from the truth the most are those things that have the kind of a highest uh, narrative or dramatic payoff. No? So the idea is things which are simply there in the background uh, are things that we will be kind of generating beliefs about. Things which are there in the foreground, so things which have the highest narrative value, are the things that we should be most skeptical about. Huh? So he gives examples. So, for instance, um, he gives an example of um, how he himself, when he was reading uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace, uh, having seen so many kind of uh, you know f f uh, um, sentences written in French, uh, spoken by Russian aristocracy. He came to the conclusion that you know the Russian aristocracy of the 19th century were speaking in French. No? Um, another kind of because another way of saying that is you know nothing would have really changed about the novel if everybody was speaking in German or if everybody was speaking in well if the Russian aristocracy was speaking in yeah choose your language. Uh, similar idea is well this is also how stereotypes work. Precisely because uh, African American characters in Gone with the Wind, like Naomi, or uh, the assistant Miller, in the eponymous uh, Miller Pierce, precisely because you know they being there doesn't have any real narrative import for what happens in the film. It doesn't really matter for what happens to Miller Pierce. It doesn't really matter for what happens to uh, Rex Butler and Scarlett O'Hara uh, because they're background. That's why. The, the idea goes, we are also inclined then to form beliefs that, uh, that these kind of representation, uh, these stereotypical beliefs on par with how, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the characters are represented. Huh? On the other end, things in, in the foreground. So things like, for instance, Schiller's, uh, Maria Stuart, where, uh, in the final act, uh, um, Schiller has, uh, Queen Mary of Scots and Elizabeth Mead. Uh, the idea is precisely, you know, because they have so much kind of a, so much is riding on this. The idea is that, well, then, you know, the readers might be skeptical uh, that, in fact, Marie, uh, uh, that Mary Stuart and, and, and Queen Elizabeth did meet before she was executed. No? Or something similar uh, at the beginning of Dickens's. Um, uh, novel Our Mutual Friend, where uh, there is this uh, kind of a, a person who collects, whose only job is kind of a, to collect uh, dead floating bodies from the Thames. Uh, one might be skeptical that there ever was such a occupation, precisely because, you know, this is such a kind of a, let's say, uh, it feels a kind of a, a narratively contrite 
part of the part of the novel. It seems like a particularly poignant way to start the novel. No? Now, as these things go, you know, you, one can always look for counterexamples. Uh, so here are kind of a couple of ideas why narrative value is probably not the best way to account for uh, 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 this, let's say, subconscious process that is going on when, when engaging fictional works. Uh, when it comes to you know think, when it comes to background, there are certain examples we can think of, which don't seem to generate any belief. So, for instance, you know, just thinking about a range of uh, uh, Hollywood, uh, you know, films about Roman Empire, everybody speaking their you know English. It doesn't seem to be the case that based on that, people come to believe that you know your average Roman emperor or uh, you know, or, or, or soldier or, or peasant or citizen spoke English. Uh, nor, for instance, if you, you know, have an uh, extensive diet of American TV shows about white collar workers such as, you know, the suits, ER, CSI this, CSI that, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that people generate beliefs that your average, um, you know, American white collar worker is as good looking as your average TV star. No? Though everybody obviously seems to be good looking there. No? Now, when it comes to counterexamples about this kind of a foreground, it seems that, you know, Kari inadvertently provides one there himself, where he, because in, in introducing this kind of um, Dickens's example, uh, he in fact says that on his initial reading of the novel, uh, he in fact thought that there is such a job as, that there was such a 19th century job as collecting dead from the Thames. No? And only later did he kind of uh, look into this. Turns out uh, Dickens invented the whole thing. And only later did he kind of uh, retroactively uh, uh, realized that there was narrative value in this opening, as opposed to kind of a thinking it's just background information. So that, in fact, kind of a opens probably the the biggest concern here, in, and it's, that's precisely what is this uh, background? You know, how, what are the criteria according to which you can you know define background as opposed to foreground? Huh? Because, for instance, I'll just return to the case of the French speaking uh, Russian aristocracy in Tolstoy. Uh, while you might think it's a background thing, uh, there is also a good reason that, you know, there is a reason for this there, because, you know, this is war and peace. Who are the Russians kind of a fighting here? It's the, you know, it's the invading French army. So, you know, there's an irony here that the Russians are, that the Russian aristocracy is speaking the language of the, of the kind of a invading troop, which is kind of a causing their existential uh, threat there. Huh? So, the point being here, you know, it's not quite clear what would be background as opposed to what would be foreground. No? And there's also things like, you know, middle ground. There are things which are something in between, even under this kind of ideal account of Karis. So consider just an example of from, uh, you know, a recent film by Jorgos Lantimos, so Queen, uh, which um, is a story about, among other things, uh, the, the, the Queen Anne, uh, 18th century, 18th, uh, 17th to 18th century kind of a, uh, uh, um, uh, what's called, a ruler of, of Britain, who in the film is represented as a lesbian. Now, this is not really background information, uh, because it is important for what happens later in the story, you know? Uh, but at the same time, it's not really the, you know, the, this kind of um, highest level of narrative value. It's not really what the whole movie, you know, revolves about. It, what the whole re movie re really revolves about is the specific details of the affair that she's having with this, you know, eponymous uh, favorite. No? So what do you do with mid uh, kind of um, level of information? Uh, and this is precisely what kind of a friend also picks up upon in her discussion of uh, genres more generally. Because, you know, if you've seen here, it seems that Curry's ex examples really come really from kind of a two domains. So it's either some kind of a historical fiction or it's 
uh, something that we might refer to as realistic novels, no? But what is background information in, you know, SF, in fantasy, you know? It might be the case that traveling by the speed of light is just background information. doesn't really do anything for, for, the, for the SF story, no? Uh, as it probably doesn't, doesn't do really much for Star Wars or something like that, or for Star Trek, for, for that matter, no? It's just there. But by, by logic of the thing, it should be treated as background information, no? But at the same time, it doesn't seem to be the case that people who are on a diet of, um, you know, SF uh, think that there is such a thing as uh, traveling at the speed of light. No? So on the basis of this, um, friend comes up, uh, well, kind of a, uh, has an idea that it's probably unlikely that there will be some kind of a, not only fiction level truth, but also as a fiction as some kind of super genre, but also genre level truth, genre level kind of a rule. Uh, but what might help here, according to friend, is uh, precisely some kind of a personal competence. No, so for instance, while you not might be, while you might not be able to uh, always figure out, um, or while it might not always be the same thing that you're might not be the same logic of acquiring beliefs in you know SF as opposed to uh, horror or as opposed to uh, realist uh, works. There might be some kind of a higher consistency in, for instance, you know when you're reading one author as opposed to another author, when you're reading when you're watching one director's films as opposed to another director's film. Uh, the issue with this is that, of course, you know it's, it's of course not impossible. But it doesn't. See, but friend does not really give any details of how, for instance, this would work on any lengthy example. No, so it doesn't. She doesn't really give an example of what it would be. So, what is the logic of acquiring beliefs on in Dickens as opposed to acquiring beliefs, for instance, in Faulkner? Or why? How would that logic change from one author to the other? No? So. As a bit of a kind of a conclusion, then uh, I would like to kind of reiterate uh, again: belief acquisitions, something that seems to be a, a pretty strong view, even among those who are critical of of, of uh, value of fiction in in in, in, in its cognitive terms. Not, not even that seems to be fully de demonstrated. Not even for you know the best case scenario of propositional facts. When it comes to mechanisms, it seems that the ones that are on offer uh, seems to be, at least at present, how they're, how they're articulated, the solutions seem to be unlikely. Uh, and, you know, certainly it seems to be the case that the more these subgenre levels are, are places where probably are, are more promising kind of to, to explain kind of a mechanisms of, of belief acquisition. Uh, but for those things, uh, details would need to be uh, provided, and of course, we would need, you know, we really would need more empirical studies, because you know, these my examples and my counterexamples revolving around narrative values. It's really just, you know, intuitive facts. It's what you know, Kari uh, uh, thinks uh, people are likely to generate belief about, and it's what I think that people are likely to generate uh, beliefs about. So it would certainly. There would be value certainly in 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 doing an empirical test of of this idea of Curry's kind of a narrative value, and certainly you know once that you do more of these studies, certainly uh, another meta analysis would definitely be uh, highly um, a, a welcome, given that the this the most recent one that I found is uh, is from two thousand and sixteen. So thank you for your time.